Ah, where did it go? All right. And now we are live on YouTube. So those of you now joining us, thank you for doing so. This is the About the Labor Minnesota Vikings, usually a post-game show. Uh, but since it's Packer week, we're going to do something a little special here. Bringing in Zach Jacobson. Once again, he was here last week to do a little uh, border battle banter. And we're going to start that once again uh, tonight with a little preview of week two. Uh, first of all, Zach, I got to ask, was Aaron Rodgers high in that post game interview with Michelle Tafoya? I mean, he's saying otherwise. He's saying he wasn't high. He's saying he wasn't on every opioid possible. I mean, because he apparently he doesn't do that stuff. But I mean, the dude looked <laughs> out of his freaking mind. So, <laughs> so I'll, I'll I would, take I would, I would, I would, yeah, I think he, I think he was. Uh, but I mean, we're not gonna critique him do. too much. I mean, the guy, what did he sprain his knee or whatever it was? So uh, you can't really fault him too much for that, I guess. What can you do? All right. I will, well, I will let's get it. started here then, huh? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Let's see here. First of all, I think we'll start with the uh, Packers and Bears game because I feel like that's a little bit more of a, an entertaining uh, way to start given the way that game went. Uh, it was kind of a tale of, I wouldn't say two halves, more of like three quarters and then another different quarter that was completely different. Uh, so... Tell me, just re instant reaction, you know, are you worried at all about the first three quarters or are you just mostly encouraged by the, the last quarter with Aaron Rodgers back? I think I, I kind of alluded to it last week. Um, I kind of expected this. Um, I obviously didn't expect Aaron Rodgers to get hurt. I mean, and I didn't expect him to kind of play sluggishly throughout the first, you know, three quarters of the game or, you know, two and a half quarters, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's essentially a fifth preseason game. I think it was, I told you last week, I told Seth to Paul, it's a fifth preseason game for the Packers, a sixth preseason game for the bears. It's going to take some time. This, this offensive line, they hadn't played together all throughout the preseason in training camp. This was really their first live game reps together as a unit. And as Aaron Rodgers said today, uh, in his locker room interview, there were some miscommunica uh, miscommunications. He thought they played solid. He thought they played well. He didn't place any blame on anybody. Um, and they really did. For most of the second half, that whole offensive line just kind of whipped into gear and played out of their freaking mm -hmm. minds. Like a completely, a completely different story compared to what it was in the first half. Um, but I wouldn't see it as a reason to worry going forward because I think they kind of set the blueprint uh, for how to manage Aaron Rodgers' injury um, and how to work with his knee, uh, which I'm sure we'll get into that later. But... I mean, when Rodgers, before he got hurt, he was three for seven for 13 yards. It definitely wasn't promising, but you kind of expected this offense to come out flat. It's week one. You know, the Detroit Lions got blown out by the Jets and oh, <laughs> Sam Darwin. The <laughs> 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 yeah, we, we got to poke fun here and there at them, but oh, of course. Um, you don't expect them to be that team throughout the season, you know, but it's, it's week one, you know, and I can't stress mm -hmm. that enough. It's week one. You know, yeah. no team in week one is going to be the team that they're going to be in week five or week 10, you know, so I wouldn't say I'm necessarily worried, but it's definitely, it's, you know, it's something that, you know, it's going to be tough to kind of shrug off, you know, because mm -hmm. you can't just pretend it didn't happen. They came out playing horribly, you know, and that's the bottom line. Right. Yeah. I mean, and as a Vikings fan follower uh, and those watching that, you know, our Vikings fans and Vikings followers can remember 2015 when the Vikings opened the season and lost 20 to three to Jim Tom Sula and the 49ers uh, before winding up winning the NFC North. So I agree with you that week one does not tell and only tells one sixteenth of an NFL season. So there's a lot to go, obviously, but your point about, you know, the week one team being the same throughout the season, not entirely true. The week one team might be the same or very similar to the week two team, right? Which is kind of the, the whole point of the show is previewing week two. Uh, but I want to make a point here about the Packers and Bears game because uh, I went, I uh, recorded the segment with Seth, Seth Tupal today for his black and, black and blue preview uh, for this week. And I compared Aaron Rodgers to LeBron James. And I said that, you know, you look at the, how the Cavs were the last few years when, when LeBron was not playing or when, you know, even before LeBron went, returned, went back to Cleveland, the Cavs were not a playoff team. 
They were basically a bottom feeder in the NBA. And when LeBron returned, they became instantly one of the best teams in the NFL they cont- or NBA, and they contended for the NBA Finals. Uh, Aaron Rodgers is out of the game ag- against the Bears, and Deshaun Kaiser enters the game. Offense can't do anything. Uh, he walks right into a Khalil, Mal- Khalil Mack sack. Uh, so, you know, I'm just saying Aaron Rodgers has the same impact of LeBron. is the, more, the most valuable player in the NFL. I don't know, but now this offense or now this team is a playoff team with Rodgers in the game, and when he's not in the game, they're a four or five win team. I don't know. Do you agree with me? Well, I will say that Deshaun Kaiser didn't necessarily he didn't play bad. He came in and that offense got moving for the first time that whole game. Like I said, Rodgers was three for seven. Kaiser came in, he hit Devontae Adams. Uh, I can't remember who else, but he was moving the ball. He got them into the red zone, and then. He walked into Khalil Mack, gift wrapped in the football. Yeah. Here you go. And, you know, that was yeah. that was that. But um, I wouldn't necessarily agree, but I mean, because LeBron James, he isn't the best ever. Michael Jordan is obviously the best ever, and Aaron Rodgers is obviously the best thrower of the football ever. So you can't really make that comparison. But <laughs> mm. so um, that's a, maybe an argument for a different time. But yeah, I, I see where you're coming from, though. Like I see, I see. I see the foundation that you're laying down to, to make that argument. Yeah. I mean, and I know Vikings fans watching are not going to like me tossing around LeBron James name with Aaron Rodgers' name, but uh, I, I feel, I, like, I I feel like he's, he's that good. I see that on your Twitter every, every day. Anytime you say something yeah. good about Aaron Rodgers, you just get attacked and it's the funniest thing in the <laughs> oh, world. I know. And Joe Buck and Joe Buck. That's also another name that triggers people. <laughs> Didn't we agree on this last week? Like, I love Joe oh, Buck. We did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. Joe Buck. I, everyone still holds the, the, 2000, the 2007 uh, Super Bowl 42 okay. against him, the Tyree catch. And now, I have, I have, okay, before we actually get into real football, here's a, seriously the last thing we're going to, before really getting into it. Do yeah. Packers fans think that Joe Buck hates their team? I would hope not, because it's like literally the opposite. Okay. Uh, well, okay, because. Vikings fans are just on Joe Buck about hating their team and loving the, loving the Packers, loving Aaron Rodgers. And I feel like I've seen the Packers fans say the same thing about Joe Buck hating the Packers. And it's just, he doesn't hate your team. Like I promise you, but I don't know. I, yeah. It, I, saw it, I saw it today actually when, when people found out uh, it was going to be Charles Davis and, and his company doing the, the, um, mm-hmm. the, the Vikings Packers game. Um, I think it was under your thread. Actually, you guys said something about, <laughs> Or Joe Buck still hates the Packers or something, and Joe Buck doesn't want to call Packers games or something like that. I don't remember what it was. Yeah, I mean, Joe Buck gets assigned the game that's going to get the most viewers because that's that's his, he's the number one broadcast team right. or on the number one broadcast team for Fox. That's the way it works. But we have football to get into. Uh, I guess we'll start right away with the the man of the hour, Aaron Rodgers. Uh, first of all, are, do you have any doubts that he's going to play this week? I think there's about uh, probably less than ten percent chance that he doesn't play. Okay. Like I, I think it, it's really hard to envision a scenario where he doesn't play, just because. Right. One, one, he's Aaron Rodgers. Two. It's more than likely. Or two, <laughs> it's more than likely an MCL sprain, and that's manageable. You know, there's there's no Clearly. way that he'll let. Yeah, clearly, yeah, <laughs> judging by last and <laughs> second half. There's no way that he wouldn't kind of force himself out there if he knows that, if he knows that it's manageable and he knows he can play in that situation. Now, the Packers on the, other, Packers, on the other hand, people are kind of worried about what their decision will be and whether they'll keep him out for, you know, looking in the long-term view, which, you know, is the correct decision. You know, they should be looking in the long-term yeah. view down the road, you know, for preserving his health. But... My my thing with that is they wouldn't have let him back in the second half of that Bears game if there was a chance of aggravating his knee injury, which according right. to Rodgers and according to Dr. McKenzie, there wasn't, which is why he was back in that game. So if there was any chance of, re- of a- further aggravating that knee injury, he wouldn't have come back in that game. The 20-point comeback mm-hmm. wouldn't have never happened. We wouldn't be having this conversation right now. Um, well, we probably still would have, but whatever. Um yeah, so I, I I don't think they would keep him out of of this game, just knowing the implications of it, especially yeah. a division game. 
after a long week. They're, you know, McCarthy's given a whole week to rest his knee and do what he has to do to get it ready. So, right. I mean, he's going to play this game. Uh, I will. I'll eat a Lego if he doesn't play. Uh, how, how's, how's, that? how's that? I mean, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but I said it, and so they, that, that's how McCarthy? strongly I feel, Rogers. <laughs> I. I you know what? I can clip it and I'll put it up on Twitter. I guess whatever. Okay, I, right, I already right, said right, it. It's on the internet. It's not coming back down. But he's going to play, all right. And this whole charade that Mike McCarthy's given to the media—that I hope we don't know his status. He's he's hanging out with the rehab people today. Whatever. Uh, it's a uh, you know they just came off a division game, and now both teams are want to know this. This is like looking back, you know, in what three four months. This game week two is going to prove to be one of the most important games of the season for both teams. Uh, and you, I can't imagine if Rodgers is 80% or whatever he is. I don't know what his percent as far as all health. but um, And if there's supposedly not a risk for re-injury, I don't know why you wouldn't play him. That would be very stupid of Mike McCarthy. and Well, I guess it wouldn't be totally his call, but uh, he's going to play. And so I... You know, obviously the Vikings have to game plan for Aaron Rodgers. And, and again, if they don't play game plan for Aaron Rodgers or if they spend time game planning for Deshaun Kaiser, uh, I hope they don't because I, 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 I'm zero. I have zero worries about Deshaun Kaiser taking over and leading a the Packers to like 30 points on the Vikings. So, uh, but, you know, like transitioning here now that Rodgers, at least I think I know he's going to play uh, on Sunday. Uh, do you see him being in him, like, you know, his mobility being a problem against this Vikings pass rush. Um, or do you, you know, how do you see that? Because I don't want to compare him to Sam Bradford now, but you know, Aaron Rodgers without the ability to escape the pocket is a different Aaron Rodgers than we're used to. Well, I will say that of all games for him to have this knee injury for his mobility to be limited, this is probably the worst possible one just because of how good the Vikings pass rush is, how good their front seven is, how good their defense is as a cohesive unit is. The thing is, the Packers, they have a plan for that, obviously. You know, they're not naive. They're not stupid. You know, they know how good their opponent is going to be this week and what they're going to do to get to Aaron Rodgers. And this is the same team that broke his collarbone last week, last year. This is the same team that is probably going to be looking forward to potentially ending his season again. And he his knee is already weakened, so that's just making their job a whole lot easier. So, you're calling the Vikings dirty players? Is that what you're doing? Of course not. I would never do such a thing like that. I would never. I would never right. even I was gonna, that. I was going to bring up what Clay Matthews did to Mitch Trubisky the other night, but I won't do that. So that was just stupid. That was just downright <laughs> stupid. Okay. Well, right. yeah. We don't agree even on get that. Me uh. The Packers have a plan for they're going to formulate around, you know, accommodate his, his what they have to do around his knee. Um, what they did against the Bears, and it's similar to what they did with his calf injury in 2014, they incorporated the offense into running purely pistol formations, shotgun formations, anything that prevents him from taking the snap under center and having to backpedal on that calf or in this situation his knee, put more pressure on the injury as opposed to just taking the snap out of shotgun or in, in the pistol, handing it off, faking it, or just simply dropping back in that position, whatever you have to do. Uh, that's going to be a huge emphasis that they're going to build the offense around probably for the next two to three weeks, you know, because the, the, mm-hmm. the injury is probably going to take two to four, two to four weeks, you know, presumably, uh, at least according to David Chow, pro football doc. Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, hey, he's the man. Um, but that's the plan there as far as that goes. Mm-hmm. Um, and they also kind of started getting like a more like a timing offense, uh, against the bears in the second half. You know? Yeah. It was like, like a quick two step drop hit his guy. You know, it kind of looked mm-hmm. like, like the Patriots offense for a minute. You well, know, they were that, scheming- that, that, that classic McCarthy thing. Now this is the one like positive I'll say about McCarthy and the offense that he's run for, I don't know, I guess he's been the coach for. It, literally the one thing like I that's this is all I have uh, okay. when time is of the essence or you really got to get the ball out quick. He's got that trips formation to the right or left where the slot guy runs kind of a flat and then the other two receivers just straight block like they don't even look for a route. They just block and that way the, the slot receiver can catch it and get up the sideline for about eight to ten yards. I know I noticed that 
back in, I think, 2012 in that season finale. Um, and there was such a shootout, and somehow Christian Ponder beat Aaron Rodgers. Uh, I remember the Packers ran that several times and picked up chunk yardage on that, and they still do it. And that's the one, like, positive, like, I'll give you that to Mike McCarthy that I have. Otherwise, I still think he should be a head coach. But uh, anyway, yeah, that, that's something I would have expect to see because they're going to try and get the ball out of Rodgers' hands really quick uh, when you have Erickson Griffin, Linval Joseph, Sheldon Richardson, Daniel Hunter, all four of them trying to, you know, sack Aaron Rodgers. That whole – that trips formation, that whole route concept, that's tricky too because those guys have to get their blocks out on time mm-hmm. like be- like after the ball gets to the intended right, receiver. Or they're going to they're gonna get flagged, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's tricky. That, that's got to be executed perfectly. I'm glad you brought mm-hmm. that up. Yeah, I, I mean I've noticed that because it's so annoying. Like I I think you – you know, and I don't, I don't love Troy Aikman as a color guy, but I think he pointed it out in that one game and – since then, I've remembered that being a thing, and there's not really a way to defend it. And I, there's so many times I remember watching the Packers where, for example, they're at the 50-yard line with 10 seconds left in the half, and, oh, there's a quick low out to Randall Cobb, 10 yards, Mason Crosby makes something from long range right before the half, something like that. Uh, moving, moving uh, kind of transitioning to the running game, Jamal Williams, uh, Ty Montgomery, no Aaron, no Aaron Jones until week three, right? Uh, so right. you have those two guys against this Vikings defense. Do you, what do you predict out of the, out of the running game for the Packers? Well, Drew, I don't see them trying to establish the run against that defensive front. <laughs> right, because I'm going to try. Be pretty... try. Well, no, they'll, they'll try. They'll give it a chance, but <laughs> at some point you realize that it's not going to, it's not working. Okay. Um, the best they could do is probably just stretch the runs outside, you know, kind of split the defense open a little bit as opposed to running right down their throat because you're not going to run Jamal Williams and Ty Montgomery down the Vikings' throat. That's just not going to work. And if it does, then agree. I'll eat crow. But, uh, <laughs> of course he would. Um, yeah, and like you said, you know, they don't have Aaron Jones until next week in Washington, so that kind of limits what they want to do on the ground. And as far as their, their running back by committee approach goes – but if you don't run, you can still get creative with guys like Montgomery. You can line him up as if you're going to run, mm-hmm. motion him out to wide receiver, ha- have him run, keep him in the backfield, have him run a Texas route out of the backfield, have him run a wheel route out of the backfield. You can get creative with these guys still. And Jamal Williams, he can catch too. He's a receiving back just as well as he's a blocking running back, as well as he's a, a power running back. There's a reason he was named the starter, and that's because he could do it all. So, you know, they might not line it up and run it down the Vikings' throat, but you know you can get creative with these guys and get them involved one way or another, whether it's through the ground game or just mm-hmm. flat out getting the ball in their hands. So there's a few ways they could do that. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really it's just Jamal Williams and Ty Montgomery right now. That's right. That's yeah. That's I mean, the show. And, and another guy that you know I, I thought would get the ball a little bit more against the Bears and didn't. Um, at least. From what I remember, I don't remember him being a big factor. Jimmy Graham, uh, you know, is, I'm right about that, right? I mean, I'm not like missing something completely here. Um, he, yeah, he didn't, have, he didn't have a big game. He was, they kind of took him out of the game early. They they bumped him uh, off the line of scrimmage. They kind of, they just, they double teamed him a lot. They, they made it a point to just kind of take him out of the game from the get go. So it kind of made the Packers. Okay take him out of their own game plan. You See, know, just because that's, that's an interesting strategy because the Vikings against the 49ers just said, here, tight end George Kittle, go wide open and we won't cover you. Uh, so I wonder if the Vikings will make an adjustment there because if the Packers, if Mike McCarthy were to get smart and start scheming some things for the Packers offense, uh, I, he should look at J- Jimmy Graham. Well, I guess look at the, the 49ers and how they – you know, got George Kittle open several times against the Vikings. And for, you know, if there wasn't a, a drop pass about 30 yards downfield or a an overthrow in the end zone, Kittle would have had about seven catches for a buck 40, buck 50, maybe a couple of touchdowns. Uh, he, unfortunately, I think he, well, I guess fortunately, he had about 90 yards on five catches. So mm-hmm. I don't know if, you know, I don't know if you saw anything in the preseason or in camp or whatever with Jimmy Graham, but is there that potential 
for the Packers? Like, have they been, have you seen a lot from the Rodgers to Graham connection where that could be a threat for the Vikings? Well, Rodgers only played five snaps in the preseason. So that right. little time that he did that, he, <laughs> that little time that he did have with Graham, uh, uh, Graham, sorry, uh, in live action before week one, it was just five snaps and ended up in a touchdown where Rogers really just launched it up to, to Graham and he came down with it. You know, he used that six, seven height advantage. So mm-hmm. I'm sure the Packers will be able to do something like that with Graham at some point. I don't know if it'll be against the Vikings because I know Harrison Smith, he does like to cover tight ends, doesn't he? Yeah. You know, Henry, and I mean, Henry what happened, what happened, happened with the game. Niners game was, you know, at least from what I saw, the Vikings were, you know, when Kyle Shanahan got the Vikings in base defense and Ben Gideon was out there, they took advantage of that matchup against George Kittle. And a couple of times there was blown coverages here or there um, on his side of the field. So I think that might have been what it was. Um, and so I presume the Vikings will try to stay out of the base uh, and try and stay in nickel when that happens. And so they can get Anthony Barr on him or uh, Harrison Smith, somebody like that. But uh, I mean, yeah, that's. Yeah, I mean, that's what I would imagine will happen there. Yeah, we'll see. That's why it might be kind of tough to get Jimmy Graham the ball. Plus, they're down. They might be down Devontae Adams. I don't know what the situation there is. He feels like he's going to be good what? to go. Uh, yeah, he has a shoulder injury. He'll play. Come on. He'll play. He will, he will play. Yeah, don't he will don't play. give me the McCarthy <laughs> thing. We're like, oh, we don't know. It's like, it's like, it's like the Brett Favre. Do you want me to give you the McCarthy thing? I'll give you the McCarthy thing. Sure. Okay. Uh, Devontae is in the rehab group today. Uh, he's doing some good things. Uh, he's going to be working uh, working with the medical staff today, and I'll know for I'll know more for you tomorrow. Uh, got to have a question, Mike. By I have a question. I have a question. Uh. So, do you think you'd be a head coach if uh, Aaron Rodgers wasn't your quarterback the last five years? And how much money do you owe him for letting you have this job? Way longer than you should have. What the hell kind of question is that, Drew? That's a polluted mindset. <laughs> that's a polluted <laughs> that's mindset. Like, the polluted mindset. That's so good. That's so that's McCarthy. A, that's, that's a polluted mindset. I just <laughs> – the most, the most I could tell you about that is just get the pad level, get the pad level low, you know. Yeah. Oh god, <laughs> that's good. That's good. You should like, honestly though, you should like make a video of that and like tweet it and have that be like a, a part of your brand or something. Cause that's pretty good until he gets fired, <laughs> which will happen, should happen soon, right? Uh, anyway, shut up. <laughs> We'll, sw- we'll switch over to, I guess, Packers defense, Vikings offense here shortly. Um, we'll s- finish up this side of the ball with uh, Vikings defensive line, Packers offensive line. Who do you see winning that matchup, and what is kind of your your X factor key matchup within the matchup at you know at that position? The interior offensive line. They need to play so much better than they did against the Bears uh, in the first half specifically. Um, Regardless of what Aaron Rodgers says, you know, I know he's going to toot their horn and be like, oh, those guys play great. There's just some miscommunications, bro. They're sure. going to be good. It's going to be fine. You got to give him just the country like, accent he had when he was high after the game too, right? My me. <laughs> <laughs> um, Justin McCray has got to play a lot better. He, he started off – okay, to his credit, he played great in the second half, but he started off very bad. He had the two holding calls – he was kind of just getting dominated. He's getting pushed back. Uh, I can't remember who it was lined up across from him, but he was getting pushed back. Uh, Lane, Lane Taylor wasn't his natural self. He seemed kind of out of sorts a little bit. It was just that whole interior um, that just wasn't up to, up to par. And that was kind of why Rodgers continuously got pressured at the beginning of the game. So I think if they can get, to, get, get off to a good start, as opposed to how they were against the Bears and waiting until the second half to kind of click into second gear, then they have a good chance of keeping Rodgers safe and a good chance of winning that matchup against the Vikings pass rush. Pass rush, not pass rush. Pass rush. <laughs> well, see, I'm super excited for the, the Bakhtiari-Griffin matchup over there because that's, I think in the past, uh, Bakhtiari has won that like pretty easily, right? I mean, he's kind of stonewalled Griffin over there. Yeah, he, right? he usually wins 
he wins pretty much all of his matchups. So yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, I mean, I guess I should have thought about that one before. I kind of led myself into that one, but Balaga and Daniil Hunter on the other side, I, I feel like that is one where. That'll also be, I mean, both of those matchups are fun to watch on the outside. Uh, but I, I really like Hunter in that matchup because, I mean, he, I think he had a couple sacks against the Niners and a bunch, I think four or five more uh, pressures. Uh, he's he's a beast. And, you know, he didn't get the sack numbers last year. But, uh, you know, even with Sheldon Richardson added, that's even more reason for offenses to kind of leave Hunter on an island over there. And I would imagine that happens quite a bit uh, at Lambeau this weekend. So that's one that I'm going to be watching and I think the Packers should be worried about. But like you said, the interior, uh, I mean, Richardson and Joseph is a lot to handle there. So uh, if the Packers interior O-line can hold up and if Rodgers can get adequate time in in the pocket, I don't know how well he can move out of the pocket, which will also be something key that, you know, the Vikings kind of play, have to play this matchup differently usually with Rodgers because he gets out of the pocket and so much effect, so much more effective out there. Uh, mm-hmm. But if he's staying in the pocket, again, it's going to be very important, like you said, for those interior offensive line for the Packers to hold up. But um, on the other side of the ball, uh, you know, I don't know how much you saw the uh, the Vikings game and Kirk Cousins, but um, what we at least what I saw was the offense was very good at times, and then there it got really sluggish, especially in the second half as they were trying to play with a lead. So, I mean, you know, like Kirk Cousins, we saw like four or five just beautiful dimes, like, you know, what – so those types of throws that only like a handful of quarterbacks can make both touchdown throws, uh, a couple of third down tight window throws to Adam Thielen. Uh, but then you saw some, some kind of mistakes where, you know, he almost had a, uh, a throw, you know, taken back for a pick six that, that would have, I mean, I think it was a third down, but that would have really narrowed the gap and made that game interesting. Uh, you had Kirk Cousins running for first downs and lowering his neck and almost killing himself. Not smart. <laughs> Uh, after you're getting an $84 million contract, uh, you know, you know, it, but we got from Kirk Cousins what we expected. Flashy plays, you know, the, the 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 big home run plays here and there, but also a little bit, you know, there were some mistakes there. Uh, how do you see this Packers defense, this Packers pass rush in particular, uh, beating the, or I guess going up, I'm going to say beating, beating the uh, Vikings offensive line, uh, which wasn't spectacular in week one. Uh, and do you see, you know, the possibility for a turnover created here and there uh, on Cousins because of that pass rush? Well, the Packers had actually, surprisingly, they had a really good pass rush last week against the Bears. Uh, ESPN NFL matchups, they posted a chart today, and the Packers had one of, I think they were seventh or eighth in in highest pressure percentage it was like 37 percent that was like seventh or eighth highest in the league and that was with pretty much clay matthews doing virtually nothing like he had probably his worst game as a professional don't laugh don't laugh it's not funny (laughs) (laughs) he had probably his worst game as a professional so that's kind of like a promising sign for the future you know and especially going against the vikings offensive line which isn't very good um yeah I, I won't disagree. Yeah, so that matchup really favors the Packers as as, as far as that goes. And uh, Mike Pettin last week, he actually rolled a, a lot of looks out with like an influx of defense of defensive backs. Like there were six on the field at one point. I think he's really relying on that interior pressure and his his defensive line to kind of create that pressure. And of course, the guys on the edge as well. But you know, there's a lot of guys in the Packers defense right now who are put in better better positions to succeed now. Like Haha ha Clinton Dix, for example. He probably played his best game in maybe like a year and a half. You know, he he could be in store for a resurgence simply because there's a new coordinator in town and he's put in better positions mm-hmm. to succeed. And that was the one of the biggest things with bringing Petten on board. He knows how to put these players in the best possible spots where they know they know what their job is. It's not too you know, over their head, it's, it's, it's simple stuff, you know, keep it, keep it Mm -hmm. likable and learnable. That's his kill philosophy. Um, yeah, they, I I just realized, I just realized that that's okay. took me a while to figure that out. The keep it, what is it? Keep it likable likable and learnable. learnable. Okay. Kill. Okay. Good. Don't call Steve Austin. Better than Um, Dom Capers. 
Who? <laughs> yeah, that, that that's something we for, like. It's kind of a, a story under the radar. Is that you know, new offensive coordinator for the Vikings, new defensive coordinator for the Packers. You know, you might see some things a little bit. You know, a lot of the personnel is still the same. Obviously, new quarterback for the Vikings, but uh, you might see you know some different things um, as far as the Vikings' offense against the Packers' defense. But I will say that a lot of what DeFilippo is doing uh, for the Vikings' offense so far has been pretty similar to what Pat Shermer did in the past. Um, and guys are lining up relatively in the same spot. I mean, Diggs was sort of the outside receiver against the Niners, and Thielen was in the slot um, and key on those a lot of those third downs. Uh, but the the D Filippo and you know the Philadelphia kind of usage of tight ends we did see a little bit. Uh, David Morgan, the Vikings backup tight end or tight end number two, played I think thirty nine forty snaps something like that. And then Tyler Conklin also got in there for a catch. Uh, the the fifth I think fifth round rookie. So. Uh, you'll see a lot of tight ends uh, mix and match here and there uh, from from the Vikings offense. But um, I want to ask you a little bit now, because this is going to be exciting for me. I get to hear your take on the Packers secondary versus the Vikings receiving core of Diggs and Thielen, particularly Diggs and Thielen, but also the Quan Treadwell and then, you know, Kyle Rudolph and I guess Delvin Cook out of the backfield. Um, you know, Packers secondary is young, talented, but it's very young. And I would imagine in, Three years will be pretty darn good. Right now, it's better than last year, I guess. Fingers crossed. Um, <laughs> funny that you mentioned the two tight ends um, that the Vikings are probably going to roll with. Last week, Josh Jackson was really the primary guy that Mike Pettin used. Um, eventually, on Trey Burton, used, right? On, on Trey Burton, yeah, on Trey Burton, and in the second half, Burton was targeted four times, and Jackson didn't allow a single catch. So. That could be kind of Josh Jackson's role moving forward, and that could be what he does with Kyle Rudolph. That could be the guy that, you know, if Rudolph lines up in the slot or whether he's lined up at the end of the line, you know, that could be Jackson's duty whenever he's not playing on the outside. He could also play in the slot. So the Packers have a guy in Josh Jackson who can play in multiple positions in that defense. Um, but I'm just – I'm not worried about Laquan, Laquan Treadwell. We can just forget about him. Um, I can't blame you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's really just going to be the Adam Thielen and, and Stefan Diggs show. I mean, Diggs, he had a good game. Was, he had, what, three catches? And that was with Richard Sherman covering yeah. him most of the game, wasn't it? He shook um, Sherman on one of those on the comeback route. Sherman ended that. up 10 yards downfield yeah. on that. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. I mean, <laughs> the guy's got a recovering Achilles. Give him a break. But yeah. still. I mean, that was- and, and Sherman did get the best of Diggs a couple times, too. So I'm not going to I'm, I'm not gonna act like Diggs just dominated Richard Sherman, you know. But uh, it's it was, it was was it was a fun matchup to watch for sure. But we didn't. You know, that's the thing with dealing in the slot, though, is that he's either going to get these, you know, five foot ten corners against him, who you know, he's six three, probably two fifteen, two twenty, uh, or you're going to get, you know, a slower, probably maybe a bigger safety, but a little bit slower, and he's going to be able to shake either one of those out of the, especially in press coverage out of there. So, uh, how would you, you know, I, I guess I didn't pay t- enough attention to this, but how are the Packers dealing with, you know, guys against in the slot? Like, who do, who would you see matching up against Thielen? I think that'll be – it should be Jari Alexander. Uh, earlier in the game last week, he wasn't in the slot very much. He was kind of motioned in there throughout the course of the game. Yeah. And once he – I think he was beat deep by Allen Robinson. I'm not completely sure. But uh, Alexander kind of – he had his struggling moments. And McCarthy alluded to that. You know, he, he loved the abilities of Bolt Jackson and Alexander and how, you know, how their attitudes translate to the field. But he also said they made, they made a few mistakes. And, for example, one of them was uh, both of them came blitzing at Mitchell Trubisky, uh, both Alexander and Jackson. And Jackson happened to get there first. He got home first, and he whiffed on the sack. And when he whiffed on the sack, he tripped Alexander, and they both collided, and Trubisky was able to roll out, roll out of the pocket. It was like it was like a, a grand, grand dumpster like the, fire. Uh, the Minneapolis miracle when Marcus Williams whiffed and then also hit – uh, Ken Crawley, I believe, right, also at like two yards away, so neither one of them could get up and make the tackle. Yeah, it was Football pretty much like, pretty much like, that. yeah, it's great. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, you, you need to attach like theme music behind it sometimes. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, they definitely made a few mistakes, but I think if not Alexander in the slot uh, against whoever the Vikings line up there, then you could probably see Tremont Williams. 
Um, I'm not sure what his passer rating was in the slot last year uh, with the Cardinals, but it was pretty low. His passer rating in general when targeted was 54 point something. His passer rating in man coverage was 1.0. So I'd imagine, I'd imagine his uh, his rating in the slot was was right around that ballpark as well. You know, pretty pretty damn impressive. Mm-hmm. And 35 years old, he was out there running Sunday night like he was 25. You know, like he was a decade younger. So. Mm-hmm. You know, if they happen to put him in the slot, he could definitely hang tough there. They have a couple options that they can they can use in there. All right, yeah, I just it, it, that's always something that you know I always I've, I advocate before last season before this move kind of happened. I always advocated for Thielen in the slot because you know he's quick enough to play that role as if he is you know like a five foot ten uh, you know like a Jamison Crowder type for example. I guess that's the first name that comes to mind, but you might think of Randall Cobb uh, and you know. But he's also 6'3", big and strong. Uh, so that always made sense to me. And Diggs just seemed like a little bit more of a natural fit outside. Um, obviously, you saw the success both of them had last year. And, you know, it seems to be working so far this year. So I always, you know, it's always interesting to me how teams try to attack Thielen there. Because, uh, you know, it doesn't seem like a lot of teams have a, a real matchup for him. Uh, but, you know, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about how the Packers would cover Dalvin Cook uh, out of the backfield or how that would be handled. A couple times there were things designed for him where he was in the slot and running a little sl- uh, slant route or um, a little bit of a, I guess, either a Texas or an angle route out of the backfield. Uh, so who would you expect to be the kind of the primary guy that would take the responsibility of Dalvin Cook out of the backfield? Because he did have six receptions last week. That's going to fall on whether or not Oren Burks plays, uh, the Packers' third-round pick. He's still dealing with a shoulder injury that he he dislocated during pregame warmups in Oakland in the third preseason game. So he was limited in practice today. So that's kind of like a promising sign that he could he could be good to go. There was um, there was no doubt that he missed the first game of the season, but there's speculation that he'd be able to be back uh, after that game. So he could make his rookie debut this Sunday against the Vikings. Uh, and if he does, that would be the primary guy that I see covering Dalvin Cook because th- that's what the Packers drafted him for. They drafted him to be that athletic guy to not only cover, cover over the middle, but can also take routes out of the backfield and keep up with running backs like Dalvin Cook. You know, he's an ex-safety. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's athletic, just like most of the Packers draft class back in April. Um, so that's, that would definitely be his forte, and that would be his man. If he can't go, then I would assume – Hell, you don't know. I don't know if the pack, right? Yeah, I, I I don't think the it's tough because <laughs> I don't think the Packers have a guy that really specializes in uh, inside linebacker that specializes in that. I mean, they had Reggie there's Gilbert. Just, there's just so uh, many weapons on this Vikings offense, right? It's just what do you do? Yeah, I mean, it's it's too good. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, they had Reggie Gilbert actually cover Tariq Cohen. Uh, I think it was a wheel route out of the backfield into the end zone, and this the. the NBC camera angles actually shine a little bit of light on that. It was like towards the end of the game should have been a touchdown. Like a good quarterback makes that throw. Like Gil- Gilbert wasn't like stuck on him. Like there was wiggle room for Cohen, like in, in front of Gilbert, you know, he was able to uh-huh. put it over, put it over his shoulder. That would have been an easy touchdown. It was like in the red zone. Um, a good quarterback outside of Trubisky would have made that throw, but obviously Trubisky is so a Kirk good quarterback. Would have made that throw. <laughs> So, anyways, a good okay. quarterback would have made this throw, <laughs> <laughs> like like an actual right. like a real a real quarterback. Sorry, I didn't mean to confuse you. Okay, I'm sorry, Packers fan who's had Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers for 30 years. I'm sorry. Okay. Hey, hey, I I didn't ask for this. I didn't ask to be spoiled. Okay. I know. I know. I'm I'm not going to deliver the 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 take where where the Packers have underachieved for with two rings in the last 30 years. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to bring it up. I didn't bring even, I didn't even bring it up. I, I know that's the point. I brought it up. Uh, oh, all right. Good one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll kind of start to wrap things up here. I want to, you know, after everything we discussed here, uh, give me, let's see. How about one player on offense and one player on defense, you know, besides like the big names like Aaron Rodgers, that they need to play well for the Packers to win. One player on offense that needs to play well for the Packers to win. 
Geronimo Allison. Okay. Now he's on, he's on the outside most of the time, right? Yes. He's okay. strictly to the perimeter. I don't think I've ever seen him line up in the slot actually, or I could, okay. just, I could be totally wrong. Um, just because we don't know what we're going to get from Devonte Adams, you know, still with his lingering shoulder. There, mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's like he pulled up at one point with a hit with, it looked like his hamstring early in the game. Then there was another point. I think he was grabbing for his back. And then apparently he hurt his shoulder on the 50, the 51 yard catch and run uh, in the third, in the third quarter. Did he miss so, a series at all? I don't think so. I'm trying to remember because Xavier Rhodes is kind of like that where he'll, he'll have all kinds of injuries throughout the season. And then just once every game, like literally every game, he'll miss like a series and he'll have a scare where he'll get taken off by trainers and everybody's like, Oh no, Xavier Rhodes out for the season, whatever. Everybody's, you know, freaking out. And then he's gone for a series and comes back and plays it. it it's, it, it's a routine. It's actually, I'm surprised it didn't happen against the 49ers. It, I think it happened every game last year. So anyway, continue. That was literally Demarius Randall last year. <laughs> It was like every game <laughs> he would get like taken to the locker room. Maybe it's just, be just watching the game. I don't know. Yeah, you'd just be watching the game, minding your own business, and all of a sudden the cameras would show Demarius Randall walking with trainers, his head hanging, walking into the tunnel. <laughs> like every week. But anyways, yeah, like I said, you don't know what you're going to get uh, from Devontae Adams or if he's going to be 100%. And I'm assuming the Vikings are going to have a plan for Randall Cobb coming out of the slot. Uh, so I don't expect him to have nine catches and 142 yards again. That leaves Geronimo Allison. You want him to repeat the performance he had last week, you know, because I think people are starting to take notice that, hey, this undrafted receiver that spontaneously made the Packers roster in 2016 is actually pretty good. And that Aaron Rodgers. Throw, is, though, I mean, that throw by Rodgers was uh, incredible. Otherworldly. I, I don't understand it. So he was like 55 yards away on the opposite hash to the back right at, at corner of the end zone. Like, I mean, and, and credit leg. to Allison for sticking to his route, but with one leg, like, I don't know how much credit Allison deserves for that. Okay, uh, come on. But if you watch, if you watch close up Allison at the end of his route, he was getting pulled on. Like, it was Kyle Fuller. It was Kyle oh, Fuller. That's, that's that's standard procedure, man. That's exactly. that's what happens in the NFL. Yeah. Wide receivers and DBs fight each other. They're they're hand fighting. They're slapping. Yeah, like little girls. He was getting pulled on like he wanted to, like, <laughs> like Fuller wanted to take him to dinner. And Allison broke away at the last second and kind of shrugged off of him and then managed to, to, to haul it in. Okay, all right, all right. You got you to gotta give the guy, the guy credit for running the route, getting separation on Kyle Fuller. That's like, a, oh, okay. how much did he get paid? 15 million? Come on, Drew. Yeah, the Bears stole him from the Packers. Yeah. <laughs> did, did <laughs> all right. <laughs> Maybe your 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 defensive uh, must play well player for the Packers. Oof. Put me on the spot. Everybody, here. everybody, the entire defense. <laughs> can I say everybody? Yeah. Can I say the whole I mean, like the whole defense? If you want to admit that the Vikings' offense is electric and high octane and cannot be stopped, because that's what you would be doing. Right. So, anyways, if, you, if, uh, if you're saying that every player needs to play well, which I mean, in theory, is true, but you know, obviously, there's always an emphasis on one guy that needs to show up. But if that emphasis is on the entire defense, then that that really says a lot of good things about the Vikings' offense. Haha, Clinton Dix. Okay. Okay. We know the interior D line is going to play well. We know what little of the linebacker. Oh, actually, Clay Matthews too. He needs to play well too. He's got to bounce back. That's a good pick as well. I could go with Clay Matthews. If, okay, if, you know what? if it's Clay Matthews that needs to play well, I'm 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 okay with that. I am okay with that because I don't think he will. Whatever, like whatever option <laughs> I pick, like it's not, it's not the right answer. So. <laughs> no, I. I, I yeah. Clay Matthews okay. has to have a good game. Okay, he has to bounce back from last week. He has to show that that was just a fluke. You know, he's because the last few years, I get it. He's been taking flack from fans left and right. He's not worth this contract. He's not the same explosive Clay Matthews that he used to be. Blah blah blah. He needs to cut his hair. He looks like a girl. 
All that. All that's true. Yeah. Shut up. You're not supposed to agree. Um, he's been getting all that the last few years, but he's played well. He just hasn't put up double digit sacks, obviously, but he's played well. You know. Um, last week, I hope it was just in once in a blue moon kind of thing. You know, he was just wasn't on a game. One wasn't on his game. First game of the season. You know, it's coming back. You know, just getting his getting his sea legs under him. Hopefully, this week he can bounce back, especially against you know a bad offensive line like, like the Vikings. Um, <laughs> but Clint, Clinton Dix too. You know, I'm, I'm gonna go with two guys just because this defense okay, has been notoriously fair. bad. Yeah, they've been notoriously bad over the years, so I'm allowed to pick two guys. Okay, give me fair some enough. slack. See, here. look at you admitting that. I like that. You're 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 growing right in front of my eyes. Admitting as a person, something right, like right that. Yes. Yes. Okay. So on offense, Geronimo Allison. On defense, Clay Matthews, and Ha Ha Clinton Dix. I like it. Oh yeah, double oh, yeah. and Clay Matthews, and Clay Matthews again. Uh, on offense for the Vikings, you know, you, like you went with kind of the 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 third receiver. I'm going to do the same thing with Laquan Treadwell uh, because I think this Vikings offense is a lot more stoppable when you can focus on Diggs and Thielen. Now I know it's not usually an easy task to just say, oh, let's just stop both of these guys. Um, but I think if you have a formidable third receiver, uh, it makes things wildly different because there are very few teams in the NFL that you can that can throw out three defensive backs and you can trust all of them to win one on one. You know, against three good receivers, uh, which I think Treadwell could be. It's just taking him a lot of time here to get going in his career. So I need to see him show up. You know, with three to four big catches. You know, move the chains a couple times. I think that would really help the Vikings. Uh, you know, it, it, with their flow of their offense, and I think help them get into a rhythm that they, you know, had for a little bit against the Niners, and then it kind of dwindled down the stretch. Um, defensively, you know, I want to say I'm going to kind of give two as well, uh, and that's not because the Vikings defense has been bad in the last few years. That is the opposite of the case. Uh, but I'll say when Ben Gideon is on the field, I want to see him in coverage. Uh, you know, whether it's guarding Jimmy, defending Jimmy Graham whether it's picking up a running back out of the backfield. I want to see him, uh, you know, perform that task. Um, and I also want to see Everson Griffin win a battle uh, and grab a sack or get some pressures on Aaron Rodgers um, against Bakhtiari. I think that would make a huge difference. And, you know, with Rodgers' limited mobility there, uh, I think that could really make an impact and maybe flip a turnover here or there. And I, I think that a turnover, really the turnover battle, I think is going to be a huge factor in this game. So um, with mm-hmm. those out of the way, I think it's kind of the moment of truth now, right? We can uh, make we can make our predictions, score predictions, uh, anything else. I mean, this can be however you want to do it. We can you can say which team wins, what the score is, um, any stats players have, any big plays that happen, how the game is decided. Um, the floor is yours for now, and then I will tell you that I, that it's wrong. But go ahead. You're gonna tell me that it's wrong. I, I actually hope you do. Oh, okay. So you think the Vikings? Well, this is interesting then because I have a surprise for you. Really? Okay, I can't wait. <laughs> you should have been prepared for this actually, because I told you last week that I was going to pick the Vikings this week. I, you did, but I, I guess I never really believed you. So I, I, I mean, that is my fault, but I never bought. I thought you were you were playing me. I don't play, Drew. All right, I stick to my guns. That's why I'm picking the Vikings to win this week, thirty-one to twenty-three. Skull! Wow, thirty-one. Skull! Skull! No, I'm just kidding. I, I am not doing that. If slash when I pick the Packers, I'm not doing the go pack go or putting cheese on my head for that matter. Because that is stupid. That is the worst tradition in all of sports. I have a cheese head up here if you want one. Right here. Right, I, here, right above my. No, please. I mean, you can have that. At least, see that. The nice thing is that you're in California. You're in, you're in California, so I don't have to worry about that coming close to me. Uh, but thirty-one twenty-three. See, I, if the if the Vikings score thirty-one points, I they they will for sure win this game, no doubt about that. The problem is, I don't see the Vikings scoring thirty-one points. I don't see the Vikings scoring twenty points in this game because, look, I I, I can't bank on a defensive touchdown like the Vikings got last week. Mike Hughes pick six. I'm not going to bank on that. The Vikings only scored 
17 points really from their offense last week against a Niners defense that's eh, middle of the road, if not a little bit below average. Uh, it, this is a different game in you know it's a divisional game at a hostile you know environment to play at against a defense that you know the secondary is young and probably not great, but I think they have some talent up front um, that could rattle Kirk Cousins, rattle his offensive line. So I, I see the Vikings struggling to reach 20 points and. You know, I always talk so much about reaching 20 points because the Vikings are, I think, now 33-4 and four when they reach tw- it's either 20 or more or more than 20 uh, when, with under Mike Zimmer. And I think the Packers reached that mark because – and I'm literally only saying this because Aaron Rodgers is that good. That's the only reason I think the Packers get to that many points. So uh, I have the Packers winning 20-17. to 17. I don't like my pick, but I think the script will be flipped quite a bit when the Packers – go to U.S. Bank Stadium week 13, but obviously that's way in the future. I think I I just have, I don't have enough confidence in this offense yet to give them uh, more than 20 points at Lambeau Field. See, we're on the opposite side of the spectrum here. Uh, spectrum here. I had them losing this week and then winning that U.S. Bank Stadium meeting. Yeah. That's what, that's what was going to lift them in the division and giving them that okay. same 11 and 5 record, but kind of give them the, you know, the edge, you know, as far That's as interesting. Uh, so, division okay. goes. So you just have road teams winning, huh? Oh, that's interesting. Pretty much. I would be surprised if – I'm trying to look at the Vikings' home schedule, and I don't see many losses, man. I don't. I'll tell you what, man. I don't see a lot of losses on that schedule. I'll that tell you gun. what. This guy's a <laughs> film rat. Total film junkie, spider two Y banana man. <laughs> oh my god, John Green. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you don't see that many home losses because uh, I do. I see the Packers winning US Bank Stadium. Mark my damn words right now on this recording that they will win this at is US good. Bank Stadium. This is all going to be on YouTube. We have a lot to clip from this, by the way. You have me potentially, but not really eating a Lego. Eating a Lego. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we have. Uh, I, of course, your Mike McCarthy uh, impression, which is phenomenal. Uh, we have a, we have a lot. I mean, I have, we have me picking the Packers to win against the Vikings this week, and vice versa for you. So one of us is going to be wrong. Uh, yeah, me, yeah. Me I, I, I can't. I can't believe. I can't believe. Yeah, and yeah, we have you doing the skull chant. I can't believe that you picked the Vikings to score thirty-one points. Uh, I, I would never. I just feel like if they if they get off to as bad of a start defensively as they did last week, I mean, like the whole the whole new coach against new coach thing uh, or coordinator, I think that's huge because we saw it Sunday night with Matt Nagy going into Lambeau. The Packers didn't know what to expect from him. Trubisky came out and he was looking like prime Joe Montana. He was dotting up the defense like nonstop. Like it was it was horrible. I saw you know, yeah. I, I well, think, right. He, he started off hot for sure. And then I saw then, yeah, I saw a stat on Twitter where he did he average like two yards per attempt or something in the second half like it was like he started you know whatever for whatever and then it was like his last twenty six pass attempts went for like sixty seven yards or something ridiculous like that it was something like that and and twelve of his twenty three attempts or no twelve of his twenty three completions were at or behind the line of scrimmage that's the Sam Bradford offense of twenty sixteen. <laughs> Yep. Completion percentage NFL it's... record. Same yeah, record. that's why his completion percentage was so high. Yeah. Yeah, well, Zach, I guess that wraps it up. Uh, so we have Zach predicting the Vikings to win at Lambeau this weekend, 31-23. Uh, mm-hmm. I am saying that the Packers are going to go in, well, they're going to defend their home turf 20-17, uh, to 17, pretty much because of Aaron Rodgers, but um, also because the Vikings offense is just a bit behind schedule. Uh I think your X factors for the Packers were Jerome Allison, Clay Matthews, HaHa Clinton Dix, and then I had for the Vikings Everson Griffin and Ben Gideon, and then Laquan Treadwell as well. Uh, I appreciate you joining me, Zach. We'll do this. We might do this after the game, depending on how entertaining it gets. Uh, we'll see. Otherwise, we'll for sure do it before the Week 13 game uh, to do another preview like this. Um, but for everybody watching, thank you. Uh, this will go up on the Vikings Territory YouTube page. Um, and then obviously you're going to subscribe there, I assume. 
And we also do a live show after every game with a couple guys at VikingsTerritory.com. So be sure to tune in for that. Zach, once again, thank you. And uh, I hope you're right this Sunday. I do not. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it.